I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my everyday life living in Latin America. A while ago, maybe even a year ago, but probably more like six months, one of my viewers asked me if I could speak about AI and large language models, LLMs. This is not something we normally talk about on the channel, but today is a Thursday. That means we're doing the live stream this afternoon, and so I'm going to be tied up doing that for a lot of the day. So all of your Nicaragua and expat and relocation and that kind of stuff, questions and topics, you've got lots of time to go watch. So make sure you tune into the live stream this evening. And before then, I need to run Ida's dog to the vet because she has had some surgery. She's doing okay, but she has a fluid patch under her skin and we need to get her looked at. So I'm getting a video out quickly today and you're going to get a lot of content. We've put out a lot of videos the last couple days because I'm kind of playing with this new format while my foot is healing, which is doing pretty well. So uh, if you have not yet signed up for the uh, Nika Abla account so you can have real-time chats with us, make sure you do that. We'll talk about it on the live stream. If anyone needs assistance, live stream is a great time. Uh, but other than that, we're going to get to AI and LLM and what it means for kind of everyone right after the bump. Okay, so AI, artificial intelligence, this is all the rage right now. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's using it. It's redefining everything in human civilization. It's going to completely change the world. Maybe. Well, so it's already changed a lot of things, but I think more than anything, it's exposing things. But let's talk about why. So first of all, what is artificial intelligence? Well, in theory, humans are intelligent. We have the ability to reason about things, to observe the world around us, come to an understanding of what things are, and think about them. I mean, that's pretty much what it comes down to. I can pick up this object and deduce that it is a remote control. I'm actually thinking about it. I can understand that it has buttons and that I can use it to make changes to something. And maybe ah, uh, this device up there, it's going to change. So I understand the concept of objects and how they exist in the world around me. And I'm able to use logic and in many cases, emotion to think about those things. So we basically have an understanding of what intelligence means. Now, not everyone has the same concept of intelligence. It is, an, uh, it is a philosophical debate exactly what intelligence is, but we have some basics that we more or less all agree on. The idea of artificial intelligence is, of course, when computer systems can do the same thing. They can come to grasp with the world around them, identify things, and, and make reasonable decisions about them. So what are we doing now with AI? What is this hot new thing that is creating the world that we now see changing so rapidly? Well, primarily, now there's more than one type, type of AI that's happening, but the big one that's getting all the attention is an LLM, or what's known as a large language model. What they do with this is they basically study an enormous corpus of written works. This is generally pulled off the internet because it's the only practical way to do it. And everything that's published on the internet is already open to the public. So it's very handy. You don't have to get permission to use it because by putting it online, someone's already gotten permission to put it on for the public. So you don't need to. And all these discussions of people who are like, oh, they're, they're stealing stuff. No, they're not, right? Like, that's just plain and simple. Are you allowed to read websites on the internet? So are they, right? You can't limit that in some way. Now, if they're stealing data from somewhere, that's a different thing. But that's not what people are complaining about. Can, people are complaining that th these large language models are pulling data from public sources that you already are expected to be pulling information from. Wikipedia, for example. And now, I want to step back a little bit and just touch on something really quickly. When most of us were young, when we were in school, now I'm pushing 50. So when I was a kid, when we went through school, there's a few things that we were taught pretty heavily. We were taught that when you're writing a paper, things that you had to do is you had to reference uh, books in the library or newspapers, magazines, things that were published by a publisher and that had money behind them. Basically, if rich people published it, it was an authority and you didn't have to think any further. You didn't have to prove that it was correct. You didn't have to reason that it was correct. You didn't have to justify anything. As long as a rich person put their money behind it, it was good and authoritative as far as the school was concerned. The school was there not to teach us how to think or how to reason or how to research. It was there to teach us that money is right and poverty is wrong. Literally, that was the lesson that they were driving home. There's nothing else to take away from that. The idea was that we would read these expensive published works that made money from the school system promoting them, right? The school system was advertising for published works. And when even when you go to the library, you say, well, that's free. It's not. 
The library is using tax funds to fund the purchase of those books. So the school was still doing things to promote business. Like they were literally working as salespeople for publishers. Uh, you would then, when you were making papers of your own, you wouldn't put in your own critical thoughts. You wouldn't, uh, you know, argue and look for research that, that backed up your position. You would take what was written and regurgitate it. You weren't allowed to copy it. You had to state what was already stated in a way that was different than how they said it, but that gave the same information and didn't alter it. Then you could reference them and you were good to go. This whole exercise was a lot of work. And what we've now demonstrated that people are now calling this exact same mechanism on a much grander scale where we're taking more sources, being more liberal about what we're able to access, suddenly it's considered plagiarism. People are like, well, they're just copying things. That's literally what we were taught we were supposed to do. Copy, but reword. And that's essentially what is happening in large language models. So let's break this down. Large language models are taking massive amounts of works, uh, written works, right? Could be published magazines, could be old ones, could be new ones, could be blog articles, could be any number of things. And it's going through and, and researching topics. And so it'll look for keywords and say, okay, so this is a topic about uh, um, the Panama Canal. This is a topic about strawberries. This is a topic about landing on the moon. And it'll figure out the basics of what it's about based on the words that are used, used and it will then use a language model to determine what someone is likely to say while going through this. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but this is the basics of what's happening. So when you then want a article about space travel or growing strawberries on the moon, it's going to go and grab articles it knows about strawberries and articles it knows about going to the moon and start just merging them together. Unless there's articles about growing strawberries on the moon, then it'll use some of those. It will approximate just replicating things that other people have said. There's some key things here. It does not come up with original thoughts. It is simply regurgitating other people's thoughts, which is exactly what our teachers taught us to do. Maybe teachers have stopped doing that now, but that is what we were taught all through my elementary, all through my high school, official curriculums, private school, public school, because I went to all these different things. Even in university, this is what we were taught. It's not about original thoughts. You're not there to put your own opinion into it. You are there to regurgitate what others have said. And now what we're finding is, of course, regurgitating without putting any real thought into it is now something that can be easily automated. And the automation can take into account more sources. It can reference them automatically and it can do what would take humans thousands of years to do just a matter of minutes. And so it is so much more valuable in so many ways. So when we're looking at this activity that humans have done for a long time, we've created an engine that is so much better at it than humans are that there's no reason for humans to ever do that anymore. But it's also exposed that there was no reason for humans to have done that previously. This is a terrible activity that has no actual value. It's exposed that what we were taught in school was absolutely horrible, that it was not a part of real education. It actually was just a sales tactic and used as a way to try to take advantage of students uh, and keep them from expressing and maybe even having original thoughts. It's also uncovered that there are huge amounts of the human experience that have been simply rewriting worthless crap that is not verified that other people have said and just spewing it out again as regurgitating the same material over and over again for profit. And so there's a lot of people and a lot of jobs have been dependent on doing these meaningless tasks. Now, yeah, they may make money, but they're not aiding, they're not improving the human experience. So this has uncovered some really big problems. And it's also uncovered some places may not have been doing a good job with the things they were doing and that AI can do it better. But in all this, there's a couple important takeaways. One is this is automating things that should be automated, right? That it's, this is actually really good. It's also uh, very importantly, not thinking. And that's one of the most important things to understand is that there's no thought behind a large language model. There's no intelligence. The idea that this is called AI is completely a marketing tactic for decades. And really through all of human history, people are easily duped by new technology and fancy sounding terms. Anything that you don't study yourself generally feels like magic. 
So in the computer space, we had virtual uh, 20, 25 years ago, we started virtualizing computers. Well, that was a very specific technical thing that was very useful and meaningful, but people liked this word and they thought, oh, if this is the hot new thing, where's my virtual whatever? And so they started applying virtual to things that weren't in any way related to the virtualization technology. It just became a hot word to apply to things because it sounded cool. It made old technology sound good by just labeling it with a new term. So things that were standard like remote access using an application from a distance over the network was suddenly labeled as virtual. That was not virtual in any way whatsoever. It was a completely unrelated meaning to the word, but people would argue for it because they don't want to be caught not being virtual even though they don't know what it means. Shortly after that, believe it or not, these were pretty close together, cloud came out as a term. This one has lingered around a lot more. People are still using the term cloud to mean anything but actual cloud computing. The term cloud computing came out in 2002, 22 years ago, and it's a very specific thing that still applies to no one who would use the term. It, even within IT circles, maybe 1% of IT professionals are able to in any way have a rational discussion about what a cloud is or when to use it. It's not that it's a bad thing, it's an incredibly good thing. Brilliant technology, amazingly important, used all the time, but never spoken about by people who are actually using it because it's such an under the hood uh, uh, infrastructure component. It's not of interest even to the average IT professional, certainly not to the average CIO. A CEO would never need to know what it is and no normal person would ever ever have a reason to discuss it. And if you think you do, you've been duped because there's no possibility that what matters to you is cloud. Anything that you're picturing as cloud is some normal, traditional, old thing that they slap the name cloud on to sell to you. In some cases, it's hosting somewhere. In some cases, it's accessible over the internet. They've slapped cloud on the web, just calling websites cloud. Everything that we had for decades, old technologies or new faces on old technologies simply got this word cloud because people became addicted to saying cloud. And people are willing to accept anything based on the marketing, not the reality. So they slapped cloud on everything. And now it has gone so far that people sell normal everyday desktop computers and just call it your personal cloud. Literally, they do this. This is an actual, like nothing could be farther. There's no, it's not remote. It's not provisionable. It's not virtual. It's none of the things that come together to make this really complicated that I'm not going to explain here. Cloud technology, none of it was there. Not one component. It was the polar opposite of cloud and yet they got away with calling it cloud because you can put it on literally anything. I can call this shirt my cloud shirt and I can make a case for it as strong as they do with most of the products they sell as digital cloud products. Now when we're talking about AI the exact same thing is happening. It's the new cloud. Someone figured out that people don't know what AI is. They have no idea what to expect. They have no requirements to letting them use the word because they just want to sound cool and since non-AI procedurally generated uh, regurgitation of whether it's artwork or written works or whatever are so easy to do, so accessible. It's still an amazing amount of work. It's still an amazing technology. But since this is so accessible but so confusing, people assume this has to be AI. And it's easy to make it look that way because it turns out people aren't very good at spotting intelligence. I know that's probably going to go without saying. People traditionally are really bad at identifying what is or isn't intelligent. It's just not something that humans are actually very good about. So when we then take random regurgitated words that were generated originally by intelligence, we assume the original authors of the works that we're talking about were actually intelligent people. If we regurgitate those sensible things chopped up and mixed together with things that other relatively intelligent, sensible people have said, the resulting situation is something that sounds really reasonable, even if there's no thought behind it. And there's a couple good examples that we can use that really help us explain what's going on. So one is the strawberry experiment. Asking AI, at least recently, maybe this has been patched so that they can get around this, but recently it was a problem. If you asked how many R's are in the word strawberry to a most large language models, it would respond with something completely insane. Now, to anyone with intelligence, it's really easy to look at the word, count the R's. We can, we're able to identify the concept of an R, the concept of a word, the concept of a strawberry, um, the concept of spelling, and pull out the R's. These things are so trivial to us that we actually 
really struggle to understand how someone could not understand it, right? If I said to a child, how many R's are in the word strawberry, they're not going to be confused. As long as we speak the same language, as long as they have learned what the word word and letters and spelling are. So basically any four-year-old will probably be able to do this without a problem. Certainly every adult can. That someone would be challenged by it is just, no, there's no way. And yet AI typically can't even begin to comprehend. It doesn't understand words or the letter R or the word strawberry or anything. Those abstract, really basic thoughts to humans don't exist to it. It's looking at a large language model. And so it looks for words that commonly are associated with R's and strawberry and just comes up with random numbers because it's not thinking about it. It's not considering its answer. It's just repeating words with a very minor parser that makes sure that the sentences have a correct sentence structure. It's pretty basic. It's incredible technology. I can't downplay that, but it's, it's not thinking. That intelligence is not there. It's not that the intelligence it has isn't very good or very advanced. There isn't intelligence that fundamentally there's no thinking. It's just repeating mechanically things that it's heard in a really complex way. Another example is and this is really interesting and has happened recently, is that large language models, of course, over time, have gobbled up all kinds of things, including practical jokes and sarcasm. But it doesn't understand jokes or sarcasm. It has no idea when something is funny or blatantly incorrect or sarcastic. These are just things beyond a large language model. These require thought. And even a lot of humans struggle with these things. So that computers struggle with it would be really shocking if they didn't. And then when you realize that it's just a word parser on an epic scale and not in any way contemplating the things that it is saying starts to make sense. And the thing that we've seen happen is that randomly, AI systems that could be used for just about anything, such as a customer service request or a ticket processor or uh, any number of things, will randomly start Rick rolling people. For real, the Rick Astley song, Never Gonna Give You Up, will sometimes randomly be inserted into all kinds of conversations, including ones that are very professional and business and in a situation where a human would easily understand it is beyond unacceptable to put practical jokes into customer responses or legal responses. But the computer having zero concept of relationships or professionalism or appropriateness or understanding the difference between a correct answer and a joke will answer with no ability to tell when a rickroll or an actual solution to the problem is the solution to the problem. It can't identify the difference. In both cases, these are things that humans will say under different circumstances, and so it's doing its best to guess blindly without any thought or reason behind an understanding of that there's a question to be answered, that there's a correct answer to be given, that there's a thing to be contemplated. But humans, on when we do this, if someone said, how do I install some software in Windows? I don't know how to install this piece of software. And you just had to respond to some simple directions. And you probably have it written down somewhere, like the AI does. And, it, and you go, okay, um, so the first thing is you gotta download it. Did you do that? Okay, did you click on it? Okay, uh, did you get this error? Did this, you know, like, what do you got going on? Is your disk full? And if they say, well, I did this thing, it's completely crazy, a human will go, that is one, not on my sheet, and two, not reasonable, or very reasonable, not a thing we're doing, or that could work too, it's just not in my playlist, right? We have all this ability to stop and go, what are they thinking? What are they doing? What could be going on? The computer with a large language model is just going, these are the words I know. This doesn't fit the thing I'm doing. I'm never going to give you up, never going to let you down. That's the right answer because when it looks through what has been right answers for loads of things across the internet, that is often a magic answer to any number of things it doesn't understand. And so it just throws that out there sometimes. And it's a really amazing example of how there's no thought, there's no intelligence, there's no reasoning in any way whatsoever. It's not attempting to understand the question. It's not attempting to give an answer. It sees a set of words come in and it believes it has a set of words that should go out when those words are received. And that's as much as there is to it. Amazing technology, amazing a lot of things, but it is not intelligent. And at this point, we're not in a world where we're even really looking at artificial intelligence. It's one of the reasons why these completely unrelated things that are just regurgitating the human experience 
are being touted as AI because there's no AI coming down the pipeline. We don't have AI that's around the corner. Now, this doesn't mean it's not going to take jobs. With things like large language models and a lot of checks and balances and um, a whole bunch more new technology and focus systems and specialized training, there's going to be a, you know, modern AI systems that have no intelligence or understanding whatsoever, but are going to be able to do things like medical diagnoses, surgical procedures, uh, doc, you know, loading docs, like replacing longshoremen, all those kinds of things. Is AI and robotics and some other stuff together going to replace a lot of those jobs? Absolutely. But what it is showing is that it is not going to replace jobs where humans are thinking or need to have been thinking. It is only capable, and this is really important, Right? It is not replacing things where humans have specific value. It is replacing things where humans are required to do tasks because we've not yet figured out how to automate them. This is actually a wonderful thing. It is taking away things where humans are frail and expensive and dangerous and easy to make mistakes. And over time, as we get these systems worked out, it is replacing them with systems that are predictable and fast and cheap and is going to increase safety and efficiency. And just like we see with England and its collapsing economy, what have they done to create this collapsing economy? Well, a lot of things. It's no one thing, but one of the major indicators, and this is a high level indicator, so a million things come together to create this indicator in the first place, is they have a massively dropping per person efficiency and productivity. So the average British citizen is producing less than they did in the past or uh, no more than they did in the past, whereas projections should put them much higher. Most of the world, we produce more every year. And one of the ways we do that is by automating things that we do that are unnecessary and allow humans to move on to more important things. We're actually using our brain and creativity and uh, intelligence actually matter. And I know that sounds terrible for a lot of jobs when you're facing things and say, wait, intelligence doesn't matter. But for an awful lot of things that humans do, intelligence doesn't matter. We're just brute forcing through really mundane tasks. And humanity has needed this for millennia. But we slowly over time have automated things that we're not good at. When we first had horses walk us around, people were probably upset that the job of walking was no longer as valuable as it used to be. And then when oxen started playing, plowing fields. The people who had been manually plowing fields as their job probably got pretty worried about that. When we figured out how to make cement instead of having to chop down trees, the people who chopped down trees probably worried a lot about that. This trend, this pattern of worrying about every little thing that comes along is probably not new. We expect that this was always happening. When cars came along, the people who worked at the livery were worried. And yes, a lot of those jobs went away. When's the last time you hired someone to work in your livery? I never have. And I had horses growing up and I still didn't have a livery worker. Uh, so yeah, jobs shift. But are we short on jobs today? No, we're just short on jobs that we don't need to do. And we don't want people doing jobs they don't need to do because the productivity of a job you don't need to do is zero. So the thing that we don't want to have happen is people to continue to do jobs that have no value when they're, you know, why have a person sitting around doing math like we, we needed to in the 1950s? Someone had to make their, their income by just doing math on paper with pens really accurately over and over and over again. Today, we know a calculator is better at that. It doesn't mean they didn't have value in the 1950s. Those people saved us, got us to the moon, did all kinds of important things that we couldn't have done without those human calculators. But now we have Electronic calculators, they're faster, they're cheaper, they're more accurate, they'll work longer hours. There's no reason for humans to do that work. There's other ways to do that work. Those humans can go on and do something more meaningful, more rewarding, more valuable, right? Not just for society, but for themselves, right? Anyone, anyone who's afraid of AI actually taking their job away, not just this kind of, uh, you know, I vague idea, oh, AI's got to take every job. Great. Great, humans don't need to work then. This will solve itself, right? No one is going to make the whole world starve. I know that that's like this fear that people have. It makes no sense. In order for the rich to be rich, there have to be people who are doing okay, but they can't be doing too badly or they'll uprise and then it'll all end. And so that's not going to happen. There isn't this, we're gonna make everybody starve and have one person left who's ruling their robot kingdom. Is that really what people are thinking? That's not where the world is going. What's actually happening is a lot of different things that could happen. But right now in the near future, which is quite some time, because remember, we have no AI on the radar yet. It's not out there. It's not coming. 
what we're actually dealing with is a lot of now exposed unnecessary human tasks that are not leveraging human intelligence that are depending on repeating other things that people have said that are manual labor that are just not requiring or benefiting from all the input that humans have or are not benefiting dramatically so so in do the case of doctors of course they're using a bunch of human intelligence that's actually happening but not for the bulk of their job not for their bedside manner, not for the initial investigations, not for checking the charts, not for keeping tabs, not for performing surgeries. Most of those things were doing things that could be automated, but there are parts of a medical doctor's day that do involve human intelligence. But you know what? If we automate the other parts, the parts that don't have value, a doctor will, one, have a lot more time to be good at thinking. They don't have to spend so much time using their brain for things that aren't valuable. And they also have a lot more value as a human being. Whatever amount of value, however you want to assign it, money or saving lives or whatever, that they're able to do throughout a day will be magnified by not spending time badly doing tasks that don't matter, but instead by focusing on the ones that do. And the other people who lose it, right? The person who's just writing articles for no reason that, that don't have an original thought in them, they're now free to go do something that uses their brain, that uses their humanity, that benefits them and makes them more valuable as a person and benefits all of society. And if eventually we come up with there's no more work to do, all activities in the universe have now been automated, then humans are able to just enjoy that, right? There's not going to be a time where everyone is imprisoned by the robot overlords. Nobody benefits from that. There is no winner. There's That's a conspiracy without a conspirator. It doesn't make sense. And there's potentially dystopian futures. Yes. There's potentially bad outcomes. Yes. But the idea that making countries and businesses more efficient is going to somehow lead to unemployment without support doesn't make sense. Could there be actual unemployment on a large scale where we cannot figure out paid activities for humans to partake in? Yes, that could happen. That's what we want to happen. That is the goal. I hope people understand this, that everything we do as humanity should be driving towards the day we don't need to work. Not just that fewer of us need to work, but that none of us need to work. We should all be given the opportunity to spend our days producing art, playing video games, and snuggling our dogs, going for walks, playing volleyball, hanging out with our children, learning new, deep, cool things, exploring the universe, exploring our own world, doing good, cleaning up, being awesome people, and enjoying our lives stress-free, living longer, living better, reducing wars, and all those things. Those are things that were in our future grasp, yes, hundreds of years out, but we're approaching it. We see it coming. We can see the benefits happening, and so many people are panicking that the thing they want is to be enslaved by the system and have to work without value just for the sake of being forced to work. That is not a positive outcome. It's not a positive outcome on a society level. It's not a positive outcome on the individual level. As a human, most of us drive towards retirement with this dream of not having to work anymore. But imagine if you didn't have to work at all. That's the actual dream. And that doesn't mean that people won't do things. Human endeavor will continue. But instead of spending our time doing meaningless tasks that can easily be automated just for the sake of keeping us occupied, we can actually do things that are meaningful and, and fulfilling and wonderful, whether it's just taking care of each other, enjoying the view, going for a hike, doing all this. You have a million things that you want to do with your time and you can't. And it could involve things that are productive today, like creating artwork or music or performances or writing video games. All those things still will remain valuable whether or not there are industries to make money off of them. If that's the thing that you want to do, you'll be able to do that more than ever before. All those things that we want won't go away by making the system work better. That's how we enable them. A hundred years ago, we couldn't do much of anything we wanted because nobody had spare time and no one got to retire. Today, that has changed so much. It is within our grasp to fix these things. So one, AI isn't AI, not even close. In no way is it trying to be AI. Large language models are just regurgitating crap. And yes, they're going to be super useful. They're already pretty useful. But their, their biggest utility is in exposing just how little utility there was in so many things we've done for so long.
They are going to be an ongoing tool that we will use. They will consistently get better and better. We will see them applied to more and more things as safeguards and understanding of how to use them and, and the pitfalls start to be known by humans with intelligence. And yes, it's going to reshape what the job workforce looks like. There's going to be some upheaval. There's going to be change. But overall, there's never been a time and there's not expected to ever be a time that those changes are going to result in wide scale negativity to the workforce. At every stage in human history, adding horses and oxtron plows and, and better uh, uh, field techniques and typewriters and printers and copiers and computers, all the things that all throughout history people have feared is going to take their jobs has created the need for more jobs. There's no reason to expect AI to change that. Every step makes the jobs we do better than before. Change is scary. That is a constant. But change is also a constant on its own. Life is scary, but it keeps getting better with relatively small exception. And this is no, no different. This is a spot where we're scared of change, but we're scared of life getting better. Life's going to get better. And the more we embrace it and the more that we don't spend time and effort complaining about it, and the less we spend time fighting it, because it's going to happen. Even if the longshoremen on the east coast of the United States manage to block uh, robotic work on the docks, the docks in Mexico are not going to block it, and the shipments will ship to Mexico instead of the United States. And one way or another, the people doing a fake job just to milk the economy will eventually lose. It may take some time, but they are not going to win intentionally blocking automation. No one ever has, no one ever will, because somewhere, somebody is going to accept that automation, and those who do the logical things are going to outperform those who don't. And the economies, whether you like it or not, on a global scale, are capitalist, and that is going to win. Whoever has the smarter government will win in the end. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. One of the reasons that I do this show with my face on the camera all the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time, is because I don't want this to be an AI show and I don't want people to think it's an AI show. What we do here is unique. There's a lot of actual intelligence, a lot of actual analysis, and a real person standing behind these things, not just words being pulled off a page. I've used AI to generate shows on other channels to see how it works and what you get is pretty bad. But even if it was pretty good, there's a risk that there's no actual thought behind it. And that can lead to some pretty dangerous results. And until we have answers for that, those things are really, really scary. I make an effort to make this really clear that not only is it not AI or anything of the sort, no large language model going on here, but and the pace at which I speak uh, makes it impossible for it to be anything to have been generated by an LLM. There's just no reasonable way that someone's reading all this that fast, especially given what you know my studio is like. But I also film myself in Nicaragua and around Latin America because it's important to not just have someone that's a real person talking about these subjects, but also know exactly where I am and why, because there's just so much misinformation generated by people or AI from places where it's easy to tell they don't have a point of reference to collect real world information. So that's one of the reasons that we do what we do here. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you know what to do. Get down in the comments. Let, ask your questions. Let us know what you think. And uh, don't forget to get on the, the live stream later today. And I will see all of you tomorrow.